You know, Jesus said the gates of hell would not be able to prevail against his church. And I just believe that. That doesn't mean everything goes our way. Uh, we know that in Revelation 13 that the beast makes war with the saints. And God allows him, at least for a limited time, to overcome them. And, you know, you take out of that whatever you want to take out of it. But um, there's, with God, even being defeated brings victory. And I know that may sound contradictory, but the beast, or let's say any devil, they can only attack your flesh. Okay? They can only work on the flesh. What they can't have is the soul. That's already been bought and paid for by Jesus Christ. And so I had a friend that used to say, all they can do is take away my birthday. Okay? So that's true. They, they might, as in Job's case, God allowed Satan to afflict and kill his family. Job, or excuse me, Satan wanted to kill Job. God wouldn't let him. But God did allow him to afflict his body. So he's got some power there. But um, God, you know, God's restraint is always there. So even at that, and you know, having our flesh conquered is not a bad idea. Amen? Because that's our biggest enemy. All right, Genesis chapter 1. Are you there already? Because I don't have it up on the screen. Uh, we left off last Sunday night talking about the stars. So let's pick it up there in uh, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14. This is the fourth day. We're going to get into the fifth day tonight. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Four things. Let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good the evening and the morning were the fourth day. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you, Lord, for gathering us together. We thank you, God, for the light of the gospel shining brighter than the sun in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that you have made us children of the day and taking us out of the darkness that we all used to be in at one time or another. We thank you, God, that we're no longer children of the night that you have made us children of the day. And Father, these things that are against us do not have as much power as they would like to, only what little that you let them. So Father, we pray to your God that you would open up our eyes and our hearts and teach us wondrous things from your word tonight. And give us your blessing. Teach us, Lord, about the sun, the moon, the stars. Teach us about the creeping things that creep upon the earth. Teach us about your creation and Father, just fill our minds and our hearts with knowledge and with understanding and give us a spirit of wisdom tonight. Prepare us, dear God. Give us understanding for days that are past and help us, dear God. Give us wisdom for days that have not yet come yet, but we know they will. So Father, we pray God your wisdom be with us. Be with Sister Bonnie tonight. And I pray God, Lord, that you would just work in her and give her more healing uh, we know, God, that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. So, Father, we just trust you in what you do with her. But, Father, our love for her is so great. We would love to see her healed. We would love to see her come out of that hospital. We'd love to see her, Father, come out of rehab even better than she used to be. And I pray, dear God, that you bring that about. Do it for Brother Roy. Do it for Sister Bonnie's sake and all their family. Do it for your glory's sake and your name's sake. Father, we just love people that are hurting, people, Lord, that are in need of help, people, Father, that cannot get out as much as they used to. We just pray, God, that you'd bless each and every one of them and help us, dear God, to be an encouragement everywhere we go to whoever we can be. 
Help us, dear Father, as we learn this morning to love you and to love our neighbors, our families, our friends, our brothers and sisters in the Lord, strangers, and even love our enemies. We need your help in that, so we pray, dear God, that you would bless your people tonight. Help us to bear the fruit of righteousness, we pray in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Now, um, I just want to kind of go over something that, uh, pertaining to the stars, because we, we found out last, you know, we've been looking at this idea that stars are angels. Now, God made promises. Let me let, turn your Bible to Philippians 2.15. And um, God made promises to the church. God made promises to Abraham that his people would be as the stars of heaven. He told, he said it several times, uh, in the Old Testament. He told Abraham, your, your, your seed shall be as the stars of heaven for multitude. Your seed shall be as the stars. He said that multiple times back in the Old Testament. And I kind of often wondered about that. You know, does God literally mean that? Well, I want you to think about this. When God led his people through the wilderness out of Egypt, they go into that land of promise. There are already people that are living there, but God is angry at them because they are the offspring of the giants and they're evil and they're worshiping all these false gods. So God says, I'm going to remove them out of that land. I'm going to put them out. I'm going to use you to do it. And when they leave, I'm going to put you in their place. You're going to live in their houses. You're going to live in their cities. It's not that you're going to have to go there to this barren land and, you know, basically build it up. It's already built. And you're going to go and you're going to move in their places. So I often think, well, we know that there are angels up in the heaven. We know that two-thirds of them are righteous angels. And we know a third of them are evil angels. And so we know, according to Revelation 12, God is going to cast them out of heaven. He's going to throw them out. There's a war going on in the heavens. Maybe going on right now. I don't know. But anyway, there's a war that's going to happen. Michael is going to fight against Satan. Michael's angels are going to fight against Satan's angels. And we know that Satan is always going to lose. Somebody say amen. He always loses everything. Biggest loser. So his angels get cast out. So God is going to, I believe, take us up and dwell and live in their place. Just like he did with the Israelites in the promised land. So Philippians 2.15 tells us that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, which is the title given to the angels in the book of Job. He calls them in two places, Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2, and then I think Job chapter, what is it, 38, where he says, where the morning stars sang out and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So he calls the angels the sons of God in Psalm 82. He said, I have said, ye are gods and all of ye children of the Most High. And so I believe that he's referring to the angelic realm being literally given the title of sons of God or sons of the Most High God. And uh, But then he says in Psalm 82 that they're going to die like men and fall like the princes. And so I take that to mean that God is going to take them, cast them out. Then he's going to translate us and change us to be in the image of of angels when they questioned Jesus about you know they gave him the illustration according to the law if a man died and his wife and he did not bear seed to receive the inheritance that this man's nearest kin probably his brother was to take that wife and raise up seed for that man's name so that that child could be could receive the inheritance and so they gave Jesus this sort of riddle they said, what if a man died and his brother married his wife and he didn't produce any child and he died and then another brother came in and he didn't produce a child and he died and there's like seven of them. So when we get to heaven, whose wife is she going to be? Because she had seven husbands. They all died, didn't bring seed. Jesus said, you do err, <clears throat> not knowing the scripture, nor the power of God. For he said, in the resurrection, they shall be as... The angels, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. 
So these, so he says to us that in the resurrection, we will then be made in the form and the fashion of the angels, the sons of God. So that's what he says here in Philippians 2. That you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, meaning all of our sin, all the shame, all the past have been wiped away. But you'll be that in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So that's what, I, that's what I think. I'm tying this idea together that when we die and are resurrected, that we will literally be as the stars of heaven for multitude, fulfilling the promise that God made to Abraham and to Israel. And here in the New Testament, we see the connection where we're going to be lights in the world, literally going to be turned into angels. Revelation chapter 1, he ta he's in the midst of the seven candlesticks. And we showed that last week. Um, go back to, there was something I wanted to point out to you in Genesis chapter 1. Turn there very quickly. Genesis chapter 1. There was something that caught my attention there. And I probably won't remember what it is. God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, divide the day from the night, let them be for signs, seasons, days, and years, let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. I think that is a connection to what we saw there in Philippians 2.15, but that's not what I was thinking. God made two great lights, set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth, and to rule over the day and over the night, divide the light from the darkness of God. So there's, I have no idea what I was thinking. Lost it. Completely gone. So maybe God will give it to me later. Uh, let me run down these verses where it gives basically the stars this identity of personhood. Psalm 147, 4, he telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. So God literally gives a name to every star in the heaven. How many names is that, J.R.? A lot, he says. Infinite, Right? There's a picture, I think, even of that. Where Adam was in the Garden of Eden, what, did, what job did God assign to Adam? Naming all of the beasts of the earth. I think that is a sort of a picture of God giving a name to all the stars that are in heaven. Adam being, of course, a type of the Son of God. Psalm 148, 3. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. So God is then ascribing a personhood to these stars. Job 38, 7, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. We saw the connection between that and what we've read in Philippians. Deuteronomy 1, 10, the Lord your God hath multiplied you. And behold, here it is right here. Ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. So God has already made a promise to Israel and he says... Even in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy was the last book that Moses wrote. And it was the book written at the end of Moses' life. He is, he has is, uh, gone through the 40 years in the wilderness, or actually 41. And they're about ready to go in the promised land. God allows Moses to see the promised land, but not go into it. And so Deuteronomy was written at the end of their 40 year wandering, and they're about to go in. And so now... Moses says to them, now God hath multiplied you and behold, ye are this day as the stars of heaven for multitude. And again, there are other places where God made a promise to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob and their seed that he would multiply them as the stars of heaven or as the heavenly host. So turn to Psalm 19. Psalm chapter 19. I love Psalm 19. Along with the rest of the Bible. I like it all. But some things just reach out and grab you. I want you to notice there up on the screen. When they wandered in the wilderness. God is an orderly God. Let all things be done. He says in 1 Corinthians 14. Let all things be done decently. And in order. God abhors chaos. God abhors uh, things just willy-nilly or rampant or however. 
God had, when he said they were traveling in the wilderness, God did not just say, when we stop, find whatever place you want and camp there. He did not do that. He ordered the tribes to be in a specific location relative to, I remember what it was now, relative to the tabernacle. The tabernacle was always set up first. And wherever the tabernacle was, then the various tribes would camp themselves in relation to the tabernacle. Like, uh, you may not be able to see this, so I'll get my, my lucky red pen out here. And I'll just kind of point you to, like these tribes here. God said specifically that Asher, Dan, and Naphtali were to be on the north side. He said specifically that Zebulun, Judah, and Issachar would be to the east. Now, that's when they camped. When they were taking up camp, they could not just go however they wanted to go. God always, in fact, I'll give you a free DVD if you tell me, what tribe was always first and what tribe was always last in line? Free DVD if you tell me what it is. Melissa. I give you half a DVD. Break it in half. Dan was always last. Dan was the tail. Think about that. Dan was the tail. And I'll give you this too. Dan was always planted on the north. And remember, there is an evil army that comes out of the north. And God said the prophecy that was made in the book of Genesis was that Dan shall be a serpent by the way. Bum, bum, ba. Huh? Okay. So, Dan, when you get to Revelation 7 and God seals the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe, Dan is not listed. Dan's not listed. The tribe of Dan is eliminated. It's cast out. Probably for its idolatry or for whatever reason. But God does not give the last day's blessing to the tribe of Dan. They're cut off. Now you have a New Testament parallel to that. You had 12 tribes in the Old Testament and you had what in the New? 12 apostles. Out of those 12, which one was cast out of his office? Judas Iscariot. It says, so it's the same. Dan is taken out. Judas is taken out. And then another is brought in to replace him. So what replaces Dan, why there's still 12, is that they take the tribe of Joseph and it's divided. Joseph was always divided in two anyway between Manasseh and Ephraim. So in the book of Revelation, you have Joseph, and I think it's Ephraim. Joseph, Joseph representing Manasseh and then the tribe of Ephraim is replacing the tribe of Dan. So Dan's kicked out. Dan's tossed away. All right. Dan was always last. He was the tail. So uh, the other half of Melissa's DVD goes to who can tell me was first. Judah. Judah. So I'll give you the whole DVD. You fight out which half is yours. All right. Judah was always first. Now, this is also interesting because every time you see the, the disciples listed, the 12 disciples listed, every time Peter always listed first, Judas always listed last, always. And they always mix it up, you know, who's in the middle. But Peter always first, Judas Iscariot always last, okay? So I do believe there's a connection there. But something more than that, Psalm 19, are you there? Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. How many believe that? Say amen. You ought to, you ought not, this is why you ought not live in a city. Or at least be able to go out into the country so you can see the stars at night. You see those stars and you just, you go, there has to be a God. Has to be a creator. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. In other words, this is God's order. This is how God does things. Day unto day uttereth speech. Now think about that process. You have cycles there. 
you have the morning, you have the evening, you have the sun coming up, sun going down, you have a picture of birth and resurrection there. So all of that speaks volumes. And if you know the Bible, then you can understand that language. And not in tonight showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. In other words, every place on the earth, they all see the same sun, moon, and stars. Um, their line, in other words, their, their verse, their verse, they're like a line of a song or a line or a passage in a book. Their line is gone out through the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. So that's what I have up on the screen, I made me a yellow dot up there. So that's the sun. So Judah is always east. So Judah then would be close to the door of the tabernacle. And when the priest goes into the tabernacle, he always, there's only one door in here. There's not four doors, there's not three doors. There's only one door here. So the door is toward the east. So as the priest goes in to the tabernacle, he's going just like the sun. He's going from east over to the west to where the most holy place is. Now think about that. The sun going down is a picture of death. Sun rising up, picture of life and birth. Sun going down is a picture of death. So... Where the most holy place is, is where when they made that day of atonement sacrifice, they took that blood and it went east to west. And in the west, then the blood was applied to the Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God, the most holy place. And so the Bible literally says that the heavens are a tabernacle for the sun and it matches perfectly our vision of the sun going from east to west. And I remember what it, what it was that I had in my mind. I've made this statement many times. That I believe, and I staunch on this, the earth is the center of the universe. Because if you look back in Genesis 1, what was the purpose of God making the sun, the moon, and the stars? He says it in verse 17. God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth, period. Now, unless you believe that God has another Bible for people on another planet and they have a different way and God does deals with them or God does the same thing with them or whatever. I don't believe that. I believe that the earth literally is the focus and the center of everything that God does. There's only one place in this universe that holds life the way God made it. Now, here's what science is doing. Science is desperately trying to disprove the Bible. So why have we spent billions of dollars sending robots to Mars? What are we looking for? Life. Because if they can show that life does exist on Mars or used to exist on Mars, then they can say, aha, all you Bible believers were wrong. The earth really isn't the center of the universe. That you have billions of planets all over the universe and you must have life forms on planets all over everywhere. And so we're not special. We're not unique. We're not the children and the special creation of God the way the Bible says. Everything that they're doing right now with astronomy, sending rockets out, Voyager, whatever it is, they're trying to disprove the Word of God. Okay? So, think about, and I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but you think about 2 Thessalonians 2, where God says He's going to send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Would it be possible that they would try to convince people that there was life on other planets and those planets are not any more, this earth is not any more special than any other planet or any other form of life. 
Therefore, God doesn't exist. The Bible's wrong. Anything the devil can use to make the Bible wrong is what he'll use. But your Bible plainly says that the purpose of the sun, the moon, and every star out there is to give light upon this one piece of real estate in God's creation called planet Earth. It's all about us. Amen? So, uh, back in Psalm 19, which is as the bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoice that there's a strong man to run a race. So there it's telling you that the son is like a high priest in the tabernacle and he's the bridegroom coming out of his chamber. That's what the sunrise represents. So, uh, I preached a funeral for a, a dear man that uh, Lisa and I, we love their family, uh, Brother Arliss Messick's. And we drove out two miles way out in the country down in Richwoods to this cemetery out in the middle of the woods. I mean, it's out there. But it's one of those old time cemeteries. And I don't know if they still do this, but they planted everybody in that place facing east. Every one of them. Why? Because they're facing the son, Jesus Christ, when he returns at the resurrection. Nobody wanted, back in old time, nobody wanted to be buried with their back to Jesus. Amen? So, I mean, it's symbolic, but it's true. Nobody wants, these people in their heart, they said, I'm not going to turn my back on Jesus. And so that's why they did that. Now, let me show you something else too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. You have twelve tribes. And God said they would be as the stars of heaven for multitude, 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 multitude. Okay. How many months are there in a year? Twelve. And they're measured by number one, the waxing and the waning of the moon. But number two, because the sky is constantly shifting. And every month up above your head you have a different set of stars. This is June, so June sky doesn't look like May's sky, and it doesn't look like July's sky. It's small motion, but it's motion nonetheless. You'll never see Orion in the summertime. You'll never see it. It's not there. Because it's moved away. It's different. So... God gave us 12 tribes, gave us 12 months, and they, the astrologers call the 12 constellations. And basically all that is, if you're measuring the stars, you note know that there is a different set of stars for each and every month. So here you have, just like in Revelation 1, you have Jesus the Son. Where is he in relation to the 12 tribes? He's in the midst of them. So when they always gathered together, here was God always in the midst of his people. He was dwelling with them, literally dwelling there with them. The same thing applies with the 12 apostles. They represent the 12 months. They represent the 12 different stars that are in the sky because we are those stars are going to be one of these days. Amen. All right. Revelation twenty two sixteen. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you of these things in the churches. I am, I like that. I am the root of the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And there he is in the midst. So back here was the Lord in the midst of the 12 tribes, the 12 stars. Here is Jesus in the... As the sun, the bright and morning star, and I don't think that's Venus, I think it's the sun, the bright one. Um, here he is in the midst of his 12 disciples or 12 apostles. In the Old Testament, it was hidden. In the New Testament, it can be seen that we are going to shine like the stars of heaven one of these days. Now, back to Genesis chapter 1. We're done talking about the stars. Let's talk about the sea. We went from the highest part to the lowest part, the sea. Did you ever wonder why God made the ocean salty? When I was a boy, 
I always wanted to go to the ocean. Grew up Arkansas, Missouri. There's no oceans there. So my dad has a cousin that lives out in the East Coast in North Carolina. So we finally got to go out there and visit. And the first time I saw the ocean, Todd, guess what I did? <laughs> Blah, that's salty. I had to find out for myself, right? All right, I like this. God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life. And the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So there is our answer to the flat earth riddle. The earth, they say the earth is flat and the heaven is a hard shell dome over the earth. But that's not what Genesis says. Genesis says the firmament is open. All right. Fowl, so we have two types of creatures created on day five. We have the fish of the sea. We have all the fowl of the air. So the abundant, the, the, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. God created great whales. Now I want you to think of a story in the Bible that is related to whales. Wow, that was quick. Todd said, Jonah, he's, he's on it. Okay, because there's a reason why this was created on day five. So we have to look at, you know, we looked at the number four represents the spiritual realm and that's the sun, the moon and the stars. What does the number five mean? We're going to look at that. God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let fowl multiply in the earth in the evening and the morning were the fifth day. So what does the fifth day mean in relation to, let's say, salvation or relation to, uh, let's say, Bible doctrine or even Bible prophecy? Turn to Psalm chapter 104. Psalm 104. I'm going to put some pictures up on the screen here in a little bit. Psalm 104, verse 24 is where we'll start. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. Manifold means many folds, many different kinds of works. How manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. I'm going to stop right here and I'll relay a, a story. I, I saw this as in a documentary several years ago, I think on YouTube. And, I, and it really, to me, it really speaks of how wise God is when he made everything in the creation. There is no way that anybody logically can say that all of the creatures on the earth and all the various forms of life and how they all get along in this earth. There's no way in the world I will ever believe that that all came about as an accident. Okay, and I'll give you an illustration. My dad taught me this and I didn't believe it. Because there was some uh, Union Electric truck was going around trimming trees and where we lived. And they were chipping it all up. And my dad went over and talked to the guys and they said... You know, he asked him, he said, what are you going to do with all them shredded up trees and all that stuff? And they, I don't know what they told him, but he talked them into dumping it in our yard. And he was going to use it for compost. Guess who was going to have to move all of that? So this is the summertime. He sends me out there with a shovel and a wheelbarrow and I got to move it probably about 70 yards from where it is over to the compost pile that we had. And it took several days. I get out there one day and all of a sudden it's steaming and it's hot in there. And I went running to my dad. I said, Dad, somebody lit that on fire. He said, what are you talking about? I said, that pile out there of the shreds and everything like that is like it's almost on fire. It's burning and there's hot in there and smoke coming out and everything like that. And he said, oh, that's compost. That's how it works. Huh? 
He said, water gets in there and in all that moisture in there from the green trees and everything like that. And he said, it gets in there and it, as it's decomposing, the bacteria in there heat it up and it can get hot, hot, hot. This is why you let the straw dry in the field before you bale it or you'll burn your barn down. So I didn't know that. I'm going, wow. So I'm digging in there and I'm getting to the center and see how hot it is. And I mean, it is hot. Okay. So there's a bird in Africa who knows this. Because this bird will build this huge mound out of dirt. And once it has the mound built, it'll dig with its, I guess its beak, it'll dig and dig a hole down inside that mound of dirt. And then it'll go and it'll gather leaves and sticks and everything it can find and pack it down in there and then it'll wait. It'll wait until it rains in there. And Ron, when it rains in there, then that bird will lay its egg down in that hole. And it'll use the decomposing hot compost to keep that egg warm while it incubates. That bird knew that thousands of years before my dad taught me that. Now you tell me what process of accidents happen that a bird learns and see what it does. That bird has a temperature sensor built into its beak and it'll poke its beak down in that hole. And if that compost is getting too hot, it'll pull some of it out. Okay. And hopefully it doesn't get too cool. It's got to stay at the right temperature. But that bird knows exactly what temperature that egg will incubate in. And if it's too hot, it'll start pulling stuff out so it doesn't get too hot. It has to be the exact right temperature. And then that egg will hatch. Who taught that bird about compost? Who, did, who put the thermostat in that bird's beak? So look at your Bible again, okay? He said in verse 24, In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. And there are stories just like this in all of the creation where every animal and every fish and every bird that God has created, God has built into their brains how to live in their own habitat. You know, we had a bird build a nest I have, an, I have a, a telescope sitting on our front porch and a bird saw that, a robin, and built a nest in that. And I always wondered how a bird will build this amazing nest with this perfect little oval inside. I mean, if you ever felt inside of a bird's nest, it is absolutely slick and smooth. No jagged edges or nothing. How did that bird know how to do that? How does it even start, Sterling, how does it even start to build a nest? What is it? How do you tie those sticks together to get the frame of it to put the other sticks in it? I've never watched a bird do it, but that is amazing to me. Bird's got a brain that big. Knows how to build a nest. And I have trouble making a bed every day. But that's God. God's wise in His creation. Amen? So is this great and wide sea. Wherein are things creeping innumerable. Now think about that word. Where else is that word used and what does it apply to? The stars. As deep as the sky is and as innumerable the stars are, so are the creatures that are in the depths of the earth. You have high creatures and low creatures, right? Because we know, according to the book of Revelation, that there are creatures down below, way down there, right? We're in creeping things innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan. What in the world is that? Whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee. That thou mayest give them their meat in due season. Think about all the creatures in the, in the world. God is the one who feeds every single one of them. Every one of them. 
Thou, that thou givest them, they gather. Thou openest thine hand, they are filled with good. When you hear me pray sometimes, you'll hear me pray, God, open up your hand wide and feed your people. Okay? Open your hand, God, and give us what it is that we need. Fill your... What's in God's hand, by the way? The book. God, open your hand so that we can feed. Amen? Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to the dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created. Thou renewest the face of the earth. So, i just ask you a question. Is man really responsible for the shape that this earth is in? I don't believe so. I think God is. I mean, they're talking about how we're creating this hole in the ozone. Okay? I just don't believe all that stuff. You can call me nuts if you want, but I don't believe it. I think God is the one who opens up the heavens or closes the heavens or whatever it is. It is all done and look, I mean, look at that verse 30. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. Okay? What happens? There's a phrase that says, nature abhors a void. What happens when you scrape up all the grass and weeds out of a property? What happens after a while, Jeff? It's going to fill back up again. Okay? They cleared out this acreage up here at the top of the hill. For commercial property, they cleared all the woods out and everything like that. And it was all just bare dirt last year. But not this year. Thou renewest the face of the earth. God is the one who's doing this. Amen? Look at this. These are, hey, kids. Look there. That's where the real stuff is. That verse where it says, Creeping things innumerable, both small and great beasts. There are creatures in the seas that I believe we have not seen yet. I mean, there is an abyss in, in different places in the ocean that up until recently we had no way of getting down there. And they believed for a long time that even if we had a ship that could go down to the, to the what is it, the Marianas Trench in the Pacific Ocean... That if we had something that would go down there, we would find it barren and no life whatsoever. And they were totally wrong. They found that it was full of life down there. And they, they, they're just going, how in the world does anything even survive down here? The pressure, the cold, there's no light. How do they do it? God made them to live where they are. Amen. There's a lesson in that. God made you to live where you are. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that you might have it more abundantly. So you may not be happy in the situation in life that's you're that's going, going through right now. God renews the face of the earth. God can renew your circumstances and give you a much better life than you've ever had before. But God can let you live where you are. God will teach you how to do it. Amen. I mean, look at these creatures. We never knew anything like this existed. Look at that. And these are real fish, by the way. Look at this one. Looks like Jimmy Durante. Look at this one with his bug eyes. Ugh. I don't think I would want to eat that. You think you'd want to eat it? Okay, I believe that. Look at all these. Look at this with the teeth. Look at that. Man, look at his buck teeth on this one. Yeah, this one's a brain head, right? A brain head. Anyway, the Bible mentions, I'm going to let you go with this. Sea monsters. Now, could it be talking about all of these? I mean... We would say these are monstrosities. Look at this one. Do you know, J.R., Callie, you guys, do you know how this fish feeds itself? It's got a fishing pole on its head. It's called an angler fish. And it has a little wiggle worm at the end of it. And it'll wiggle that as bait 
it looks like a worm. And when a fish comes by to grab that worm, that thing will come out and launch it and grab it just like that. That didn't happen by accident. God made a fish to fish the way men fish. That's not, it is cool. That's not an accident. So God mentions sea monsters in the Bible, Leviathans in the Bible. Read Job 41 about Leviathan, that it actually breathes fire and boils the water as it's going through so that the water looks like frost because the flames, underwater flames coming out of its mouth. Read Job 41. You'll see that these ancient sea mariners who witnessed incredible beasts, they weren't always lying. Now, you know, people like to make up stories or they like to make uh, something bigger than it, what it really is. But they weren't all lying. And just because science says, well, that may have been around 65 million years ago, but there's no way anybody could have seen it now, I say they're wrong. Okay? Coelacanth. You know what a coelacanth is? They had these fossils, Sterling, of this fish called a coelacanth. And they said it lived 60 million years ago but became extinct. And there's no way anybody could see one now. And they were wrong because they have actual specimens of live coelacanths that have been caught. And science said that they died off 65 million years ago, but they're still here. Okay? So, I believe the earth is not 65 million years old enough. Amen? So, I think that there are still things in the water that men would say were dinosaurs and, and died off millions of years ago. I say they could still be alive now. And... Solomon knew about them, called them sea monsters. He wrote Lamentations. David wrote Psalms. There's that Leviathan. Job knew what a Leviathan was. Isaiah knew what a Leviathan was. Several of these other Old Testament writers, they saw things in the waters that we would say were dragons or sea monsters or whatever, but they were there when those men were living and they knew what they were. So it just tells you your Bible is right and science is wrong on that. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. I want you to think about where the beast comes from. Where does he come from? Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for a good day. Thank you, Lord God, for wonderful bread from your word. Open your hand, Father, and provide food for all of us. Give us sustenance, give us meat, give us even a little pudding and ice cream to go with it. Give us some good things that are savory to us, Father, that helps us enjoy the Bible that we're studying. But Father, Lord, fill our hearts with knowledge. And with that knowledge, give us understanding. And with that understanding, give us wisdom. There are days that are coming, Father, that may be dark days to the world. And they may not understand what's happening. But Father, give your people light and knowledge concerning that. Bless all of our people. Be with Sister Bonnie. Give her special grace, Father. Help her to get back on her feet much quicker than any of the doctors could ever imagine. And just give that family your grace and your blessing. Give all of our families grace, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.